Stairway to Freedom, Chapter 11, Dictates of the Heart. If we try to imagine how emotions formulate deep within us, feelings and passions, we inevitably are drawn in our thinking and our expressions to an area which we call the heart. It is clear that we do not consider the physical organ, the heart, to be the object of our appraisal, but that we are considering an abstract concept that uses as its symbol a shape with which we are all familiar. Does it ever occur to anyone to question why considerations of emotion like love, desire and beauty should focus upon an organ of the body which is largely muscle and whose sole function is to act as a pump for the blood passing round the body? Do we ever consider why a brave man should be considered big-hearted? Autopsy would almost certainly indicate that the heart of the bravest hero and that of the most abject coward were of approximately the same size. Therefore, it is clear that we are speaking metaphorically and we refer to the heart when, in fact, we refer to something else with which we have no ability to quantify. Let us examine in detail the events occurring in a human should he experience the emotion of falling in love. The law of mutual attraction, like all of God's laws, is ever and always at work attracting like to like. As an individual reaches puberty, he finds that certain longings begin to manifest within him. He feels a sense of lacking, of incompleteness, which he satisfies initially by mixing with numerous friends of his own age at school and in leisure hours. Later, that circle of friends widens to include people of roughly the same age group but of the opposite sex. These people are drawn together by the law of mutual attraction, the sense of longing in each individual being the catalyst that binds them together. Sooner or later, it is usual that one person feels drawn towards a particular member of the opposite sex. He or she reaches out emotionally and that pull is sensed by the desired one who is compelled to respond in a certain manner. Let us suppose that a group of young people of mixed sex meet regularly for social reasons, and let us further suppose that a young man feels attracted towards a particular girl. He manifests his desire to become familiar with her on several levels of consciousness. In a physical sense, he may sit near to her, talk to her, and generally spend more time with her as an individual than with others in the group. His body will assume certain postures, now known as body language, which she would observe subconsciously, whilst in an auric sense, the power of mutual attraction is sending a call from one of his auras which will be received by the girl. She then has to decide how to respond. Initially, she will be flattered by the attention and will respond automatically to his body language. The aura that has received the call for togetherness too responds automatically and positively for it is a natural law that like attracts like and just as two magnets come together without questioning why so a person responds to the call of another. So at first she is drawn towards the young man. If all goes well they will come together and fall in love. However, the young lady may herself have cast an eye on another young man. Decorum prohibits her making overt gestures to him, but her body language and her auric call would be sent to him and he too must respond. The young lady is now in a quandary.
She feels obliged, indeed is obliged, to respond to the first party, and yet she has a complex interplay at work with a third party with whom she may hope to achieve greater things. He may be more handsome than the first individual, be taller, stronger, richer, have better employment prospects, etc. What ultimately she will decide is anybody's guess. There is little logic in the way most people choose their partners, and perhaps it is better that way. Once, however, she has made her choice, she will cease to respond to one of the boys. She will show this openly by word, by look, by body language, by action, and, most importantly, from the point of view under discussion, she will not respond with her aura. It was stated that the law of mutual attraction works automatically bringing like to like, but, like all of God's laws, it is capable of being manipulated by the mind operating at the correct level. Just as the first young man in our story reached out exclusively to the girl he fancied, so that girl, once she responds and devotes herself to him, would cease to respond to any other call sent out by any other young man. She does this automatically, but it is under the control of her emotions. The reason that the story was described was to indicate some of the ways in which humans operate in a conscious manner and also subconsciously, and to lead us into an area that relates to love and attraction. That area is known as the heart. More properly, we should state that there is a chakra, an entry point into the body, that has its centre at the heart. It is often imagined that the chakras only enter the physical body. It is not quite correct. The chakras are an etheric opening or doorway for particular auras and, because they are of fine matter, could not enter the body. They actually have their entry points centred within the etheric double and it is that which relates closely to the human form. However, in essence, the effect is the same. As by the law of mutual attraction a young lady responds to a man, so their auras relevant to their chakra reach out and intertwine, so to speak. This mingling of two auras has an electrifying effect known in modern parlance as a gestalt, which means the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts which means that by joining the two auras together into one, because the law of mutual attraction has achieved its desired effect, spiritual energy is released which will cause electrifying and exhilarating emotions within each individual. We say it is love. To repeat and clarify, what is happening is that through the action of two people becoming, etherically, one, a payoff is made by nature. The law of mutual attraction is constantly striving to achieve its aims. When it does so, energy is released. Matter has been raised and the effect is felt as love. It is a beautiful emotion. It makes the whole world seem right and good. It makes one feel like a giant. In later years, assuming the couple stay together, that feeling is accepted into normality and appears to lessen. It does not lessen. It is accepted and the mind turns to other things. One realises the difference should the partnership cease for whatever reason and he returns to normal. The sense of loss, of isolation, of grief and misery is keenly felt until that too is come to terms with and the individual accepts it. 
his life returns to a sense of normality again and he or she might possibly begin to seek new partners through the original act of joining a group from which he can begin to make selections and send out overtures. The law of mutual attraction never ceases to work. The Gestalt concept is of great importance to the world. It is the way energy is created. Without the law of mutual attraction and the explosion of energy released as a result of adjoining, all life would die out. That action is occurring at all times, in all things, whether they be mineral, plant, animal or human. It is absolutely vital to life everywhere in the universe. The result of the Gestalt is always beautiful. Life joining life always creates happiness and joy. In simple terms, just go into the garden and look. From the cold, dank earth, from the animal droppings, springs plants, flowers of the most incredible variety, pattern, form, size, colour and beauty imaginable. Hold in one hand a piece of earth, crumble it and see how unattractive it is. With the other hand, reach out and cup a flower. Study it closely. Really look with all your concentration at the flower. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Was anything man-made comparable to that flower? As you release it, And as you drop the earth, rise and stand still for a moment. What do you feel within you? You feel exhilaration. You feel your chest swell. And maybe you will have tears in your eyes. You will feel love. What has happened is that you and that flower mingled your auras in common affection So the Gestalt released energy which gave you delight and also similarly benefited the flower. That is the reason gardeners spend so long tending their plants. They are constantly surrounded by heightened emotion. Most true gardeners are happy, contented people. It is suggested that you too might grow flowers. However, It is not sufficient to hoe them occasionally, water them when you feel like it. You must, to obtain the effect described, care for your plants. Reach out and mingle your auras with them. The plant will respond and grow better, and you will feel better. Similarly, pet owners who really care for their charges obtain happiness. The love for each other reaches out and rewards everybody so involved tremendously. One wonders why any person would wish to hate another when by loving each other and caring for each other, all are made happier. Similarly, in spiritual healing, as the healer and patient join in the common desire to achieve wholeness within the patient, the patient must and does respond and the healer too benefits. Any would-be healer should therefore not merely go through the action of placing his hands upon the patient and stand bored for a few minutes and expect results. He must desire to reach out emotionally to the God made manifest in that patient in a similar way that two young lovers reach out to each other. The patient will sense the call and will respond. The energy released will bring a feeling akin to love experience and the patient will feel rejuvenated. Pure love is a noble emotion. It is not sullied by base thoughts. In the young, procreation is vital to the retention of human life on earth and so that love rapidly turns to thought of sexual union. This is natural and proper in the young when bodies are healthy and the individuals have the stamina to cope with the stress that young children place upon people. However, as we mature 
and as the necessary auras fully envelop us, the thrill of first love remains uppermost in their minds and they spend their lives chasing from one partner to another in an attempt to recapture and relive the gestalt that occurs when two auras combine. To a small extent, they succeed. As they meet a new partner and join in sexual union, there is an exchange of emotion that causes feelings of euphoria, but that is rapidly dissipated as each partner realises that sexual attraction is not love. Therefore, they are forced to find new partners in order to attempt to achieve satisfaction emotionally and, usually, are doomed to failure. This is not love, and this is not the manner in which one should live. It is not normal to live a solitary existence because humans are gregarious creatures, and equally, it is not correct to seek many partners. The norm is for a young couple to meet, to fall in love, to marry, have children, and grow old in togetherness and harmony. Of course, that is an ideal state and, like all ideologies, is not always achieved in practice. For one or more of many reasons, the partnership may not succeed in an ideal fashion, in which case the individual who may be left would tend to follow the example given earlier and reach out for another partner. In such a case, it is inevitable that what is experienced is an adaptation or variation to the ideal, which is also the norm. Due to the fact that all is one, that which affects one affects all, and, therefore, should the harmonious state that is considered to be the norm not be achieved in any single couple, then all of mankind is slightly affected. The happiness of everyone is slightly marred. One can, therefore, realise the tremendous importance that is placed upon the correct, perfect relationships between individuals, as that relationship is influential in the balance of harmony and happiness to all individuals, and couples thus alter the balance of power between good and evil. It is therefore suggested to all who seek partners, that they do so with the utmost care. In Western civilization, couples tend to meet in a haphazard fashion and either live together or marry to satisfy basic emotional needs. It is obvious that the chances of such an arrangement succeeding in an ideal fashion are slim. The divorce courts are full of the debris of unwise commitments by individuals who had no guidance on how to choose a partner. In some eastern countries, husbands and wives are chosen, marriages are arranged for financial and power reasons by parents who place no consideration upon the most fundamental factor involved in relationships, love. Divorce is not encouraged in such areas, and so whole families are raised in relationships which are far from perfect. In some cases, love grows between the partners, but in many, there is merely a sharing of space, time and sexual relations with little or no love. This is obviously incorrect. Unfortunately, Youngsters are given little or no guidance in how to choose partners to share all of eternity with. This state of affairs is incredible. Vast sums of money are expended in advising children and adolescents on sexual matters, on family planning, on marriage guidance counsellors and on divorce lawyers, but not one penny is set aside to enable information about the correct method for enabling the right choice in partner to be made. There are no classes in school, no high street bureau, and yet the process is so simple. Imagine how much suffering could be avoided if all couples, indeed, lived happily ever after and the divorce courts were empty, 
if the children's homes, now full of discarded offspring, were a thing of the past. Imagine how much all of humanity would benefit from having families living in peace and harmony. The process will now be described and it is advised that all youngsters, both male and female, should adhere to this advice in peace and in patience for, once the call is sent out by one person acting correctly, his ideal partner will respond. However, that prospective partner may be far distance, perhaps in a foreign land, and so there may be a delay of days, weeks, years even, until the call is answered and the ideal couple meet. Therefore, patience is required. You will know when the correct person, destined to become your soulmate, has entered your sphere of consciousness. The gestalt will occur that will instantly alert you to the truth. Therefore, it is proposed that, should you be seeking a partner, that you sit quietly, close your eyes and, in simple everyday terms, ask God to open your heart and send the call that will bring your ideal partner to you. That is all you need to do. Once you have sent the call, thank God for the fact that the call is already winging its way to the destined one. There is no need to repeat the message daily. God does not need reminding. Therefore, send the message once and thereafter spend your days in a state of readiness awaiting the answer to your call. It will be answered sooner or later. There is much incorrect thinking concerning the term soul meat. It has been suggested that the spirit of God that is made into humans has a duality, a positive and negative, which is made into two people, one male and the other female, who spend their lives in a search for each other, stumbling through relationship after relationship until they meet by chance. This is nonsense. The power of God, which creates all life, creates everything as individual. You are not part of a duality. There is no mysterious other half somewhere blindly seeking you as you blindly seek him or her. But there is someone somewhere who is, by chance, an exact foil for your personality. Indeed, there may be more than one. If you consider for a moment, you have a particular personality that is the result of the ray that you travel plus the experiences that you have gained along the route and, in addition, genetic influences gained from your parents. That has given you a particular personality which, whilst unique, is and must be similar to that of many other people throughout the world. There are a finite number of permutations of personality, but an infinite number of people. You can rest assured that there is someone somewhere in the world whose personality is similar to yours. Equally, there are people whose personalities are diametrically opposed to yours. It is often supposed that people with opposite personalities should marry each personality aspect being balanced by an equal but opposite personality trait in the partner. That, too, is nonsense. If you have ever encountered anyone who thinks completely differently to you, whose views on everyday affairs, on diet, on politics, on religion, on behaviour, are the opposite to yours, you quickly discover that communication is impossible, as you have no common ground to share experience on. By that token, you would realise that your ideal partner would be a replica of yourself, not physically, but from a personality aspect. Our old friend, the law of mutual attraction, of like attracting like, will ensure, should you ask, that any and all of the opposite sex with personalities similar to your own will be drawn to you. 
You do not need to wait until half a dozen prospective soulmates are in attendance before making your choice. The first one will be quite sufficiently close to you to provide you both with a harmonious existence for all eternity. Four, make no mistake, the relationship under consideration is not expected to endure simply for your human incarnation, but is required and should create an atmosphere of love and harmony for all of your long existence on the road to God. The simple act of asking God to help you find a soulmate should and will create a bond between yourself and your partner that will endure forever, bringing joy to you both and joy also to those who come into contact with you. Remember that all is one. If you are happy, everybody benefits. If you are sad, the whole world saddens too. Thus, the matter of choosing a mate is simple. However, there are a number of areas and events that complicate matters. The first to be considered is this. Until now, few had the knowledge that you now have on how to arrive at a successful marriage. Therefore, you may already be married to someone who is not correct for you and does not bring you the contentment that is correct. Further, you may have children. It is not the wish of the White Brotherhood to cause dissension between any couple or any family. Life will bring experience to all in any circumstance. Life uses every situation to provide a platform for experience for someone. Therefore, we wish you to understand and appreciate that even though you consider yourself married to the wrong person, that relationship is not a waste of time. Far from it. It is providing valuable experience for you both. Experience of the results of making wrong decisions. Experience of learning patience in trying conditions. Experience of seeing the other person's point of view, even though it be the opposite of yours. Further, there will certainly be souls awaiting incarnation in the very family atmosphere that you have who need the experience of an abrasive domestic situation. It is suggested that if you consider that you have married incorrectly, you will talk the matter over with your partner in the light of the information given above. Not every person on earth has the spiritual development to appreciate the wisdom given, and if that applies to your partner, then you must respect that point of view. However, should you both be able to comprehend how the laws of God operate, then discuss your relationship and pray for guidance. It may be that you will decide to divorce. That is up to you both. If it is so, ensure that it is a decision of you both based upon godly concepts and not merely because one of you has found someone else more sexually exciting. A marriage between two people based on love should and will endure forever. If there is no love, then there was never any marriage. You may choose not to divorce. That is the path recommended by the brotherhood. Your relationship will endure for your physical lives. Should you have married at the age of 20, and should you both expire at the age of 80, your relationship will have lasted 60 years. That may seem a long time, but if you can appreciate the meaning of the term that you will live for all of eternity then 60 years is not too long. Once you are freed from your earthly environment, you can search for your soulmate and spend the rest of eternity with that person. The reason that we recommend that you remain together is to allow you to benefit from the experience, as was mentioned earlier. Also, should you have children, you have a duty to nurture them towards God and they will not be in the best environment in a broken home or in an institution. Provide the best environment that you can for your children. 
We repeat and stress that if you consider your relationship with a partner to be a mistake, then discuss it with that partner. Pray together for guidance. Should you decide to divorce, then so be it. Should you decide to remain together for your earthly existence, then try to find common ground where you can share happiness. Understanding of the process occurring within you will allow you to rise above these limitations and permit you to combine in some sort of partnership if you try. You have a duty to yourself and to God and indeed all life to be happy if you can. Try and be happy together in a give and take relationship. Who knows, love may yet blossom if you give it the chance. Some there are who are destined to live alone. They have chosen that path for their earthly incarnation and no matter how hard they try, they would not be able to have a successful relationship. To do so would be to fly in the face of their own karma. Once again, should you be single and find relationships difficult to maintain, pray to God for guidance. If you are meant to marry, then eventually a partner will appear. If you are not, you will remain single. It is not normal for humans to live solitary lives, but there are from time to time individuals born who have chosen that path in order to complete a set of experiences or to allow them to be free to complete some particular work that they have set themselves. Pray to God and you will be informed of the future that you should follow. Follow it in peace and in God and in the certainty that once your earthly incarnation is finished, then you will rejoin your family and friends in the spiritual realms. Another group of people who do not normally fit together with ease are those who have travelled through time in a working partnership serving God and who have decided to incarnate together to further God's work on earth. These people may not be soulmates in the accepted sense, indeed may have widely differing personalities, and yet may succeed in a harmonious, if stormy, relationship as they seek to serve God made manifest in man. Such people, as may all, may be born many miles apart and may spend a number of years in searching for each other, but eventually they will meet and their work will begin. Theirs may not be the most harmonious of relationships, but because they work for the good of others, they will subjugate their personalities to the needs of others, and so the relationship will work. These people may incarnate again and again, either in pairs or as individuals in their desire to serve God in man, and it is implicit in this that they are spiritually more mature than most people on earth at any one time. Their path is different from most people's and they live by different rules. They provide service to God and all are blessed by the work that they do and by the benefits they receive as reward. We must now consider homosexual people. Traditionally, public opinion sways from abhorrence to acceptance of these individuals who feel most happy with an emotional and sexual relationship with members of their own sex. We will consider the rights and wrongs of homosexuality and what the attitude of society should be to such people. Let us state that embryo spirits of God are non-sexual as are very mature beings. Before we develop fully into active humans, long before we incarnate on earth, there is no question of sexual identity. We are merely human and content so to be. Similarly, once we mature to the point that we could be called wise, we no longer take any interest in the sex that we adopted in order to incarnate on earth. The point where we begin to take an interest in what sex we are to adopt 
is when we arrive at one of the twelve etheric staging posts before incarnating on earth. Because we need to experience certain events in order to help us mature, we realize that we will need to adopt a certain persona and sexual gender. During our stay in the spiritual realm that we call the etheric, we, as was mentioned in another chapter, seek a suitable host family. When that family decide to have a child, we pay close attention and should that baby have the correct attributes, we remain close to it and influence its growth to assist it to become either male or female. It is suggested that the gender of an infant can be influenced by time of day, by drugs or by a number of other events and influences. It is not true. The spirit awaiting incarnation influences the embryo in the womb to become the sexual orientation that the spirit requires. Under normal considerations, the baby is born either definitely male or female. However, as we know, some are born in a body of one gender, whilst the incarnating soul considers itself to be of another gender. Therefore, we assume that something has gone wrong in the plan. The events that decide the gender of a baby are simple in that, in conjunction with the ubiquitous directors of life, rays are directed to the embryo baby that will cause it to tend towards male or female. However, nothing in life is perfect, and there is a tendency for the genetic makeup of the parents to give the baby a sexual orientation. There are other influences, such as the phase of the moon, which subtly influence the baby also. The result, sometimes, is that, for instance, a male baby might be required, whilst, in fact, a female baby is born. Once it is realised in the etheric realm that something has gone wrong, one of three choices is made. Either a new soul of the same sexual drive as the baby is found, or the baby is left without an incarnating soul, in which case the baby will die, or the original person incarnates. If the first event happens, then there is no problem. If the second happens, the baby is still born, which causes unhappiness to all for a while, whilst, in the third case, a homosexual is created. We can see from the above explanation that homosexuality is not some perverse and wicked punishment wreaked upon an individual, as some would suggest. It is merely a person making use of a body to avoid waste, but that person and the body that he incarnates in are sexually opposite. This state of affairs can surely be understood and appreciated. If it were, then the individuals concerned would fit into society and gain from the experience. However, no one has bothered to find out the events occurring which cause homosexuality, and so they are either treated as objects of disdain and scorn and abused, persecuted and killed, or, more rarely, they are treated with reverence and made into demigods. They are neither. They are ordinary people in the wrong body from which they can learn a lot and from whom we too can learn acceptance. However, it must be noted that the state is not natural and there come into play a number of emotions that are peculiar to that state and also a number of diseases that would not normally occur. We state with force, however, that should you be a homosexual, you accept the situation and proceed on your path to God, all else notwithstanding, and 
if you know a homosexual, that you accept him as you would a heterosexual. All are from God and all are part of you. Accept all life and everybody will benefit. The situation is quite different, however, in the case of a person who deliberately sets out to follow a path to God at an early age. We think, of course, of Buddhist priests, of Catholic priests, and of devotees to certain religions that proscribe sexual activity in their leaders. The act of restraint in a sexual sense causes a number of emotions to build within the framework of any who follow that path and those pressures are not always beneficial. Sexual frustration causes an imbalance, psychologically speaking, which is unhealthy to the individual and unwise in a spiritual advisor of men. As has been stated several times, it is not normally considered normal nor beneficial for humans to live solitary lives. That implies also that emotional relationships between members of the opposite sex should normally grow and sexual union is a natural result of such attachment. It assists the development of the power of God by releasing energy and, in turn, benefits the individuals concerned by raising their spiritual energy. The resultant effect is that the couple should be happy and all around them should have their spirits raised by contact with the happy ones. Should individuals choose to join a religious organisation which prohibits marriage but the individuals require and need companionship and sexual relations, then conflict, inner conflict, occurs. The manifestation of this conflict would be seen as irritability, poverty of spirit and an unwillingness to spend time serving their flock. Should this occur in a priest or a nun, then it is obvious that the person would not be considered to be very suitable to advise others within the community who might require a great deal of patience, time and love in order to deal with the problems that their path through life has presented. In defence, should one point out to any priest, monk or nun of any celibate order that it is perhaps an unwise course to follow, they will argue that the founder of their religion, Jesus, Buddha, or whoever it might be, was celibate. It would no doubt come as a great shock to many such if they could cast their minds back through history and view the earthly incarnations of the founders of their religions. They might well be shocked to find that they were normal, well-balanced individuals who experienced all that God provided and still were able to perform great deeds that history noted. Time has formalised and stylized the lives of many great spiritual people out of all recognition of the truth that they themselves experienced. And one of the myths that time has created is that celibacy leads to godliness or rather that the path to God is blocked by thoughts of sexual attraction between man and woman. Use your common sense to discover the truth. Do you think that a person full of sexual frustration is the best servant of God? Would someone who had never experienced love, marriage, family life and all the rich pageant that normal people experience really be in a position to advise, to say, I know what you are suffering because I too have suffered, as opposed to saying, I know how you feel because I read about it in a book. We therefore suggest to you that you follow the dictates of your body and your emotions in relation to God. There is absolutely no point to be gained from sexual abstinence unless you feel that you do not require sexual contact yourself. The so-called benefits apparently gained by such an act are by far outweighed by the detriment caused by emotional upset. 
God's plan is for all people to live together in love, peace and harmony. The family atmosphere developed by two people in love with each other and in love with God is the ideal setting in which to raise children. Those children, hopefully, will, when adult, commit themselves to a lifetime of devotion to God and will in turn marry and raise children in a like atmosphere. Thus will the word of God spread in truth. There is never any need for ascetic disciplines on the road to God. So follow God, and if you feel the desire, enjoy a normal sexual life that encompasses godliness and normality. We do not recommend excess in any area of life. That which, deep inside you, you know to be right, is the norm for you to follow. Always keep to the old adage, moderation in all things, and you will be working within the framework that children of God should adhere to. The spiritual aspect of sexual harmony will benefit yourself and your partner, and by implication all life will benefit. Ensure that you follow through prayer the precepts that the word love implies. Then you will always be at one with yourself, with God and with all life. That oneness is at the heart of the search for God. Seek God in everything and all will be one. Should those of you who are yet bachelors require sex to satisfy natural sexual urges, who is to condemn you? The demands made by a healthy body require satisfying. For too long has sexual relationship within marriage been blessed and encouraged by orthodoxy, and yet the needs of single people, both male and female, ignored. And yet the young normally have strong sexual urges. The result of suppression of sexual urges is a distortion of the emotional content of that person, resulting in action being taken in a different avenue. We note that many young men release sexual frustration in bouts of drinking and fighting. Girls, similarly affected, often turn to work of some kind, such as business commitment or politics, when, if they had a natural sex life, they would be happy to spend their time in more suitable pursuits. Therefore, we who advise you seek to present to your comprehension a declaration that we consider that, even outside of the concept of love, sexual gratification is realized and agreed as necessary, but at the same time, we do not wish to be misunderstood as saying that you have carte blanche to perform casual sex with any number of partners that base desire might seek. There is moderation in all things, and the reason that moderation is required is that the aura of a person reflects his desires and his actions. These in turn raise or lower spiritual energy, and to accord with those emotions, it is necessary always to be in a positive frame of mind which cannot happen should abuse of the body and mind take place. Common sense is required, and that will enable you to act correctly. Do not fall prey to lascivious thoughts. Enjoy sexual relations in happiness, in simplicity, in harmony, and in love, ensuring that you keep your focus upon your goal, which is oneness with God. By that aim, you will enjoy life as it was meant to be enjoyed, and will still keep your mind pure. The concept of purity of mind extends beyond the limitations imposed by accepted theories and dogmas in relation to control of thoughts. The term purity of mind can and does require action to be taken to purge from one's personality all thoughts and actions that would be considered to be in contradiction to oneness with God, 
God in heaven and God incarnate in man. The idea behind the term purity of mind is to create within the framework of which a human consists a developed force that is squarely at one with God, leaving aside all possibility of separateness created by wrong thought or deed. That concept is not easy to put into practice, particularly whilst one is incarnate on earth, for one is put into situations many times each hour that tempt one to think thoughts less than pure. If there was the opportunity to retire into an area of peace for a sufficiently long period of time, it would be possible to bring the level of consciousness up to that required where peace of mind, inherent impurity of mind, would obtain and could be maintained in the face of onslaught by evil emissaries attempting to distract love from the area of tranquility and godliness. Eventually, of course, one's defences would be battered down and then thoughts of corruption would enter, causing one to need to retire into an area of harmony with God to recharge the spirit. Fortunately for us, there is such an area, a haven, to which one can and should retire daily in order to release the spiritual power that will ensure total control of emotion and thought. That area is the mind, and the process for entering is meditation. The process was described elsewhere, and reference should be made to that section if there is doubt of the technique or procedures to use. Daily meditation is vitally necessary for all who wish to have purity of mind. What happens within the mind during meditation is that the path between man and God is laid bare, the gates opened and barriers lowered. Personality and ego, which normally shroud the mind like a prison wall, keeping God out and the mind prisoner, will be forced to step aside as the light from God bathes the mind in purity and love. The mind will absorb some of that power and will grow in stature and in purity. The power of the ego will decline in the degree that the mind absorbs spiritual energy from God and, eventually, should the disciple continue to meditate each day for long enough, ego will disappear and, although personality remains, it is now a God-filled personality shining with the power that bathed the mind. Thus will there be purity of mind, of heart, of spirit, and the individual so endowed will become at one with God as he becomes a reflection of God's power. That power may be sent to others in meditation as a healing force and may be used to assist others in purifying themselves. Whether that power is accepted into the minds of others is, of course, dependent upon their abilities to push ego and personality to one side and allow their minds to be bathed with God's power. Please note that we stated that God's power may be reflected from a pure soul and directed towards others. The power of God does not come to anybody directly from God. It requires objects and or people in order to manifest itself. Without living things, whether they be humans, animals, plants, rocks or atomic particles, the power of God can only exist as a potential, a principle. It cannot exist in reality. It is always passed through, or more correctly, reflected by, material and living things. In the highest spiritual realms, the power of God is directed by those archangels we term the directors of life towards other creatures. As has been mentioned before, the point at which the power is created and by what means is not known. However, it does exist. 
it exists at the highest point of creation. The directors of life take that power, they are the first to manipulate it, and they direct it towards its chosen destination. That destination might be earth, or it might be any one of a vast number of areas. Because the directors of life are without sin, they act as perfect reflectors and the light shines undiminished. It will be picked up by those who seek the light at the next highest level and would be reflected from them to those lower down the scales of life. It will ultimately shine towards you. If you are filled with materialistic thoughts, your personality under the control of ego will prevent you from absorbing that power and it will be wasted. However, should you follow the advice given earlier and meditate regularly and correctly, the ego will diminish and the mind will be bathed in the radiance emanating from God. It will then seek to be reflected from you to someone else in the hope of bringing enlightenment to all the world. This presupposes that you realize that you must reflect the light to others. If you do not know this, then the light having helped you will thereafter be wasted. So it is necessary to direct the light to others. In order to do this, it is not necessary to have a directory of every living soul in order to recite their names. It is sufficient during meditation to will the light to others, blessing all the world in God's name. That point of light that you were instructed to visualize will flood your mind. You will see it with your imaginative facilities because your physical eyes will, of course, be closed during meditation. However, you are not imagining that light. You are using the same areas of consciousness that imagination uses, but the light will be real. During each meditative session, visualize the point of light and eventually you will be flooded with pure white light. Do not strain to achieve this stage. Do not try to visualize it. It will come to you in its own time as you develop the meditative technique. As you continue to meditate more and more, so you will be flooded with this brilliant white light more frequently and eventually you will be able to visualize it instantly as you begin your meditation and hold it in your consciousness at will until you finish your session. Later, you will learn to visualize the light during your normal routines and you may be bathed in it for all of each day. That state is recommended as bringing great joy and power to the student. Should you meditate in groups or should you compare notes on meditation with your friends, take heed not to boast that you be the first to see the light. It is not a competition. Through thoughts and deeds, help each other. If you boast, you will encourage others to state that they too have achieved illumination when in fact they might not have. To lie is a sin. Do not put yourself in the position of sinning or encouraging others to do so. All will suffer. As was mentioned earlier, that light, once seen, should be directed at random to all the world. Even those who harm you should be bathed in the light. It will reflect from you in the degree that you are pure. If your mind is soiled, you will not reflect much light. It therefore behoves all to become as pure as possible. Meditation and prayer will purify you. Perform it each day and ensure that you do not sin if you can avoid doing so. Examine your faults and dismiss them. Do not dwell on them. To dwell on faults would be to increase their power over you. Take charge and dismiss them from your life. Actually examine your thoughts and words, your deeds and motives all day long. 
any act, word, deed or thought that is not pure should be rescinded. Gradually, you will purge yourself of fault. Your mind will become pure and you will reflect God's power undiminished by your flaws. That light will be picked up by someone else somewhere in God's kingdom and will be reflected to go on and on purifying all. It is important that you are pure of mind because if you are not, you cannot absorb God's power and you cannot do God's work, nor can you be happy and contented. The kingdom of God will be closed to you by your own thoughts. It is important too to be pure of mind in order to reflect God's power undiminished to others. You received it in full strength. You are required to send it on its way at full strength. You can see from the above that the power of God, his light, does not come to you directly from God, but comes via many life forms. That is because all is one. You and your mind is part of everything and everybody's mind. It is called universal mind. Through purity of mind brought about by diminished ego, you attune yourself to universal mind. Through that, may the storehouse of knowledge, the secrets of the universe, be revealed to you as you tune into that grand concept. Through the action of purity of the mind, the auras swell with power, God's power, which is universal power. The aura that is attached to your heart chakra swells, and because it has done so, the emotions involved with it increase. Those emotions may be termed universal love, because although one may define them as happiness, tolerance, understanding, compassion, etc., they are subsets, so to speak, of an all-embracing force, love. Man experiences love when he becomes involved with the girl of his choice, who in turn responds to him. That love, whilst important, is poor indeed compared with the universal love to which we allude. It cannot be imagined, nor can it be pretended. It develops within one as purity is attained. Purity does not mean, incidentally, the strange, twisted, puritanical concepts where physical love is regarded as dirty, where natural bodily functions are not considered, where nakedness is abhorred. We talk of a concept different indeed from that. We talk of a relaxed and peaceful state in which all thoughts of violence, greed, lust are not considered, indeed do not any longer exist, but where acceptance of all is appreciated. It is a calm and submissive state where, even during sexual union with one's beloved partner, purity still exists. Should that state be attained, then everything becomes pure. Everything is from God and cannot be unclean. It is our appreciation that is unclean. Purify the mind and all will be pure. Love all mankind and you will be loved by everything and by everyone. The light that you will come to visualize in meditation and which you will learn to carry with you all your days will ensure that you see everything and everyone bathed in its glow and all life will sense it and respect you. The quality of your life will transform you as you align yourself with the power of God. The riches of heaven will become yours. With God's riches, you will have no need to seek greedily the riches of the earth. God will provide you with all that you need. Therefore, we urge you, no, we require you, should you wish to be accepted as one of the White Brotherhood, to meditate daily in peace and in love. By stating that you must meditate daily, we also ask you to use your common sense. If you are ill, 
If you are too busy or too tired, then of course you cannot meditate. But try to arrange your life so that you have time to meditate once a day. You may do so more than once a day if you wish. Eventually, you will reach a stage of permanent meditation. But initially, once a day for a few minutes or half an hour is sufficient. There will gradually come into your life changes that will alter you as described above and we promise you, you will never regret them. You will only ever regret receiving this information and not acting upon it. Seek to align yourself with God and all else will be added to you. So let it be.